Good afternoon, anybody, everybody. Can you hear me? So, um, as Doug said, uh, this is project is the brainchild of uh, George AA7JV. It started about six years ago with the construction of two prototype ribs. Uh, around four years or so ago, it was decided that NorCal was going to fund the development of the first round of production ribs, if you will. And uh, that's about the time I got involved in the project. I'd known George for a number of years, and it's really been a, a great opportunity because the collaboration, the, uh, the development, everything has been a lot of fun, not to mention two or three trips to the Bahamas every year to test this stuff out on George's boat. That is not bad at all. Um, but uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. How many folks here are using remote access technology for stations? Okay, so there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. There's a lot of solutions, a lot of ways to go about it, and we'll talk about our experiences, what we're doing. Maybe there's some nuggets there that w that you can take away from this to help you with your endeavors. Uh, but Doug left me up here, and I have no clue how to advance the slides. Doug? <laughs> Space bar? Okay, cool. So the first generation ribs were intended to be used on de-expeditions to enable a minimum footprint on some of these entities that you can't get permission to go to. You know, no tents, no latrines, no cooking facilities, no 70-year-old guys trucking through the surf on a daily basis to get to and from the operating site. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great work. Um, last year, it was decided that we would kind of come up with another use case. And I just coined it the Gen 2 rib. And what it is, it's the same physical, environmentally controlled enclosure, but instead of one kilowatt station, it's got two 100 watt stations. And that use case is to enable remote access to the de-expedition from operators around the world. So um, the overview, it's, it's two Flex 6700s. Um, there was a PC in the rib with running smart SDR, but we've moved that onto the boat. Um, we've got a Pi that's running uh, a node red uh, flow that we developed for monitoring and control. Um, it's also running uh, an audio application called Sonobus. Is anybody here familiar with Sonobus? Awesome, because you need to learn about it, because in my opinion, it's the best audio transport solution out there. Um, we're using N1MM for logging. Uh, for uh, digital, we're using WSJT or JTDX, whatever um, direction the wind is blowing that day. What started this project was we wanted to try and make it work over a 3G or a 4G wireless network. That just didn't play out. Um, latency, throughput issues. Um, but about that time, Starlink became available. And so we started, we started testing these various configurations, various software packages, and um, we came up with what we think is a great solution. So block diagram, um, you've got the two flexes, uh, the pink or beige box in the middle is the monitoring and control. Um, we've got antenna selection. The rib has a integrated cooling system, two heat exchangers, one inside the box, one outside the box pump coolant, moves the heat out of the box, keeps it uh, within uh, nominal operating temperatures. So this one's a little more complicated. Um, you need, we've got uh, LDMOS amplifier, which requires 48 volts. We have uh, 12 volts for a lot of the other stuff. We've got five volts for the Pi. We've got two cooling systems. The amplifier is actually water cooled. And the performance of the cooling system is actually amazing. It's much faster than my experience with air-cooled amplifiers of similar power levels. Um, all this is in a case about five and a half, six feet long, 18 inches square, and weighs about 100 pounds, so it's easy for two people to carry it and transport it. Uh, I don't have a slide on it, but what George has built, as I don't know, has anybody seen the landing craft that he has built? It's a pontoon boat. Outboard in the back, it's got two ribs on it, two generators, and antennas. You drive, he t when he leaves the boat, 
The radios are running, the generators are running, they're talking to the network on the boat, he pulls it up onto the beach, and within five minutes they're making cues. This is compared to a conventional expedition where maybe it takes you a day to get your first transmitter on the air because you're moving all your materials on and it's a big, huge logistical challenge. Oops. Okay, so um, if you run around in the node red circles, you've probably come across or heard of Warren KD4Z. Uh, he did all the node red development for us. Simple ribbon that runs on top of the screen above N1MM or your FT8 software. Gives you a real quick indication of what's going on, power out. These button green buttons to the right, those are all alarm indicators. And we can, you know, the operator can see this as well as the control operator. So we've got eyes on the system all the time. It will also send a text message if there's an alarm on the system. So you don't even have to be in front of the radio, you just need to have your phone and you'll have notification within a couple of seconds whether the amplifier is kicked offline or the SWR is high. It's a, a pretty slick deal. Um, it blows up uh, and there's some uh, control um, panels available to do further diagnostics and uh, it works out to be a real good solution. Warren rolled this once, it's had very little modification except for the various radio configurations. Um, I want to stop here and back up a little bit and talk about the solutions that make this up. So the, the, we're using remote desktop, we're using any desk as our visual uh, communications between the uh, PC that's located at the radio and the client who's operating the system. So uh, we're using Sonobus which is very cool, and if you're doing audio stuff for remote, you need to look at Sonobus, because what makes it work really well, especially over satellites, is that it has dynamic buffering in both directions. You can set the depth of the buffer, or you can let it run automatic, and when you have networks with varying latency or jitter, the terms are used kind of universally these days, it really helps with delivering a quality audio signal. Um, N1MM, of course, but what the beauty of this is all of the software we're using is free. And it's cross-platform. Sonobus will run on Mac, Linux, Windows, or Android. So you can use this with your smartphone, as will any desk. So the clients who are using the system just need to load the software. It's, it's as close to zero config on the client side as you can get. And so uh, we think it's, it's, it's pretty optimal in its simplicity. Um, the reason we're using Sonobus is, um, as opposed to using uh, some of the internal Flex um, DACs, and, is that with the Flex DACs, you don't get side tone. So we take the audio out of the back of the radio, plug it into a sound card that's plugged into the Pi 4, and we have side tone, which is really comforting for the audio or the operator when you're 1,500 or 2,000 miles away and you want to know what your radio's doing. Uh, Latency on uh, Starlink is about 50 milliseconds nominally. You don't really notice it much. A little bit of challenge if you're sending real fast and stations are coming back to you real fast, but it, uh, it's, it just works really well. So, um, Doug had asked me for a picture with the rib. Um, unfortunately, I didn't make it down there for that trip. That's, I, I had the foresight to get a Bahamian license. I knew George was going down. He knew he was going to play in with us. I called him up and said, hey, why don't you let me do the contest with this? So the rib was located on Smile Island, west of Eleuthera. C6 AGU, and they've done CQ Worldwide from down there doing ribs up from George's boat for several years now. They were about a mile to the east of us. It was unattended. The island is occupied, but there was nobody there, so we hooked it up to a solar system and it was battery powered. The rib was placed a short distance from the beach. It's back in the brush, and uh, I've got another picture coming up. Uh, the antennas we're using, uh, N6BT has a, a multi-band vertical that you tune. It's not resonant on any band, but you tune it with a base-mounted tuner. And we found when these antennas are mounted close to the salt water, they really scream and it worked real well, they're quick to assemble, you know, it fits into our deployment model. Um, I did CQ Worldwide CW, uh, I was on the air for about 20, 22 hours, 
and how uh, WHC did ARRL 10 meters, uh, we used a solution on 60 through 10 meters, and including what George has done in the Pacific in the last month or so, with RIB technology, we've made about 17,000 cues. All of them are remote. So uh, here's a picture. Um, the two masts to the left side of the photo are uh, 900 megahertz verticals, and they provide the connectivity from the island back to the boat. So even though I was operating the station, Magnet had connectivity to it as well. You can see the, um, the V8 antenna uh, to the right, the rib, the uh, Starlink panel, all of that is located back in the brush. And uh, it, it worked seamlessly. I mean, except for maybe a couple dozen momentary audio clicks during the 28 or so hours on, was on the air, it worked flawlessly. So here's a picture of George um, doing some adjustments and testing on one of the ribs. This is one of the early model ribs with the uh, one and a half kilowatt amplifier. Um, it just works. Um, you know, George is a brilliant guy, entrepreneur, in a, entrepreneur innovator, inventor, um, and it's a lot of fun to, to be part of this project. So, um, how did we do? Um, made just short of uh, 900, or made 961 cues, 29 zones, 88 countries, with 100 watts. Uh, ran the majority of the contest. I quickly found out that I wasn't real strong because I wasn't breaking any pileups, at least not easily. So, uh, you know, I did a little bit of search and pounce, but uh, I felt it was more productive just to sit there and call and see how I ended up. Um, finished third place in the world in the single op explorer category. Interestingly enough, C6AGU finished third place in the, uh, the multi-op category. And it was as close to being there as I could have been, you know, considering that I was going over a satellite link, um, didn't have any real technical issues, um, and I think that we've come up with a real good solution. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you can email me or grab me, and I'll be more happy to dig in it further and help Doug get back on schedule here a little bit. So, um, you know, got the certificate. It looks good. It's hanging on my wall. Um, so what's up next? Um, as Doug said, George is in the Pacific. Um, and I guess Doug reached out to George, and that's how I got stuck doing this. Um, he's operated from a number of locations in Fox Oscar. Um, he's made 11,000, 12,000 cues in there. Um, George called me about four weeks ago and said, uh, hey, we're in this part of Tahiti. Uh, we talked about going to Ducey last year when you, know, you and your YL were down on the boat. And he said, can you get a landing permit and a license? And I said, yeah, no problem. So two weeks after that conversation, we had the license and landing permit in the hand. Um, and we'll be operating from Ducey. We're probably going to get there around the 9th of June. And we'll be there for about uh, two, two weeks, maybe a little bit longer. The biggest challenge at, at Ducey at this time of the year is the weather is horrible. And there is no shelter at Ducey. There's no harbor. And so we're anticipating that we're going to scoot in behind some weather, we have to time our arrival, get set up. And George and I may end up staying on the island in a tent, and they'll have to take the boat out and clock around the storm because there's no place to, there's no safe harbor there to ride the storms out. So um, I went through this pretty quick. Um, Doug's not giving me the hook. So uh, <laughs> um, do I have a couple, time for a couple? Right here. Because when we start, what's that? Repeat the question. There. So why are we not using a smaller radio? The Flex is a pretty big footprint. Um, because of the time we started this project about four years ago, it was the solution that uh, the, that George felt was best. The amplifier's home built. It's open frame. Um, yeah, it would be nice to make them smaller. In fact, 
We are looking at some smaller radios in a box that could be taken to remote places, and the goal for that is 30 pounds or less that goes in and overhead on an airplane. And it would have all basically the same set of functionality. It's a bit of a challenge because SDR radios are not real small, at least not most of them on the market. You know, they ship with a lot of air inside, my opinion. But um, we're looking at coming up with, with a little easier way where a two-man team can go somewhere with two radios in the overhead, set them up quickly, and uh, leverage this technology, these applications, to operate locally as well as provide some remote operation as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Ray. You're welcome. Thanks, Ray. Thank you.